Did Chris Parsons' appearance at this past weekend's med camp assuage FSU fans' concerns regarding his future here at Florida State as a signal caller? And also, is there a case to be made for A.J. Duffy, the true freshman, to start over Jordan Travis for a 2022 season? All that and more on today's episode of Locked on Seminoles. Our Locked on Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, folks, welcome into the full blown doldrums of the off season episode of Locked on Seminoles. I'm your host, Max, right there. You've got Drake, and we are supporting you, supporting us. Throughout this offseason. If you're here with us today, 6 6 2022, as we record 6 7, as you listen to this, take some solace in the fact that we are less than three months, right? We're less than a quarter of a year from playing Florida State football. And while that sounds like a long time, it's going to fly by, right, Tris? You know it's always going to fly by, man. Time always flies by, man. That is just how it goes. But today, I think we need to talk even further into the future because. While a lot of exciting stuff is going to happen when toes hit leather and our Florida State Seminoles take the field, things uh, on the recruiting trail are probably going to matter more because, you know, the team this year, we kind of know, I think, but barring disaster, we kind of know where this team's going to be. And I think that really what this year is about is like, can we do well enough to get a recruiting class that can put us on a trajectory to have the performances that we expect to have two and three years from now? Um, that's not to say I'm like giving up on this season or anything, but I think that that's the ultimate goal, right? Like we're not going to win a championship this year. So it, it, it yeah, that we, is what we're trying to do. The best thing we need to do right now is actually set ourselves up for probably not this year, obviously not even next year, but possibly two years down the road when it comes to actually winning. Also we're recruiting to as well, because recruiting is a lifeblood at any single college athletic program, whether it be football, baseball, or soccer. Like that's what you really need that overall tech, like have a solid foundation, actually build up to the greatness. Yeah, I mean, look, there. so y'all know this. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of recruiting. If you are, well, we'll talk about it for you today. Um, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Um, but that's what college football is all about. Like, as, as sad as it is, it, there's a reason most of these coaches can't coach in the NFL. And, in fact, I'm going to go one further and say, like, remember all the stuff with Jimbo and Saban and, and all the stuff? Um I, I think that's why coaches are being so weird about NILs. Cause like most of these guys know they can't coach like objectively the, the best coaches in the NCAA can't really be the water boy for an NFL team. But if you're a good recruiter, you can win a ton of games. Now, unfortunately, Florida state has uh, recently not, not been doing so hot in either department, the X's and O's or the off the field recruiting, but or we're hoping the luck turns the around. Jimmy's and Joe's if you want to make it rhyme, the Jimmy's and Joe's right. Right. Um, but we had a mega camp this week. Now, it wasn't as exciting as last year's mega camp. I don't think there was a slingshot driving around from what I heard. I asked, and no one could confirm or deny it. But we did have a couple guys in town that mattered. First of all, Chris Parson was there. Now, Chris Parson is the three-star or four-star recruit, depending on which service you look at, who has been committed to Florida State for a little over a year now. We have now survived an offensive coordinator leaving a promotion of Alex Atkins and a new quarterback coach being brought in, right? So one guy being replaced by two. Uh, we have even survived offering two more quarterbacks in this class without him decommitting. And I think that him being on campus this weekend is a really relieving thing to see because this would have been the weekend to make a statement without making a statement, right? Had he not been there, like your number one recruit quarter or your number one quarterback on the board doesn't come to your main quote unquote elite camp. That would have looked really bad. So I think people were excited to see him there. Um, Drake, do you do you read into it positively or do you just read into it as like it's not a negative because he was there? It's not a negative. I know a lot of people are saying it's a great thing that he you know showed up and it is a good thing. If he if he hadn't showed up, I'd probably be like, okay, the kid's gone. Um, I say it's not a negative nor a positive, primarily because he actually will be visiting Mississippi State this next weekend. And as he's doing that, Brock Glenn, the one of the kids that we offered along with Rick Collins, will actually will be on campus visiting themselves. And Chris Parson, he may be playing high school football in Tennessee. He is originally a Mississippi State kid. I'm pretty sure either his mom or his dad or both his parents attended Mississippi State. 
So we'll see. He's uh, he's unofficially visiting there. So to me, I wouldn't be shocked or worried maybe until if we see an official visit actually going on that because one of the things that we saw last year with Nico Marchio was that he commits were not permitted to officially visit other campuses. And it seems like I think Norvell might be loosening that rule just a little bit, allowing Chris Parson actually head over to Mississippi State and hang out with uh, the pirate Michael Leach over there. Yeah, I'll be honest. Mississippi State's one of those programs. I'm a little more concerned about an unofficial visit than an official visit because they're going to see the campus, which probably is nice. I don't know. I've never been there. Um, they're going to get handed a bunch of a bunch of cash or NIL deals, whatever we're calling it these days. Um, and they don't have to meet Mike Leach. Uh, I know Dave loves him, but I, I don't think I, I don't I can't see a world where a kid who's good at football from anywhere west of the Rockies and south of the Canadian border would find Mike Leach moderately endearing. You mean or east, have, right? Because like he's a Western Coast guy. Did I say west of the Rockies. West, yeah. No, I meant to say east. Sorry. Um, any anybody from like where the Rocky Mountains are, so basically every state but Oregon, Washington, and California is what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Um, I, I don't think a one on one with Mike Leach would ever be a good thing. Um, he's funny, but you know, if I'm in the mood to be honest, because it's kind of late at night, I, I, he's a clown. Like I, I, if, if Mike Lee's tried to have asked me to let my kid play football for him, I'd laugh. Like, I don't care how much money he handed me. The guy's a joke. So um, the problem is Mississippi state boosters really want to land good recruits. Mississippi state loves football, Mississippi state. I just looked up a picture has a beautiful campus. So him going there without Mike Leach screwing it up. I, I'm like a little worried about, I don't know. See, Mike Leach is one of those people that like, we're not going to make this an entire thing about Mike, Mike Leach. I think it's either you love him or you hate him. I mean, I didn't know the man wrote, you know, was an attorney. He actually got his law degree at Pepperdine. He also yeah, wrote a I book about, did. I think, I the art of war, that. like something like discussing the art of war by Sun Tzu. He also discussed like that. He's he's an intriguing fellow, but it's one of those camps where it's like, I agree with you. That's why I remember when Dave was pushing for it. I know Trey Rollins, a huge fan of him too. It's just that's the kind of guy that wouldn't gel, I think, really well with South Florida kids or Florida kids in general because he's just a, like you said, He's a he's a uh, intriguing one. He's a weird character at times. That being said, I, you know, Chris Parson, I think, I think he could be a very good quarterback, but I don't think he's like a Sam Howell level, right? Like Sam Howell, in my opinion, changed the trajectory of North Carolina under Mac Brown. Like if they don't get Sam Howell, I don't know if they ever make a bowl game with Mac Brown, right? Like that's just that's kind of how I see it. Um, I don't think Chris Parson is that. I think if you were to lose him and, and get Brock Glenn or Ricky Collins, that would be an okay trade. It wouldn't, I'd rather, I think I'd rather have Parson than Glenn. And I'd probably rather have Ricky Collins than Parson, but I think Parson is going to be much more likely to be in this class than Collins. Like, I just, I don't know. I think, honestly, look, looking at Chris Parson, his floor might be a little bit lower than both those quarterbacks you you listed, but I think his ceiling actually is super duper high because he's extremely athletic. He, he has a lot of very, you know, Russell Wilson as, you know, attributes to me with Brock Glenn. I watched a little more of that tape. We discussed, you know, his hip movement, hit playing his feet, his mechanics are pretty good, but I do think that Parson might have the stronger of the two arms. And then with Ricky Collins, I think Ricky Collins is probably the best person to probably be the second QB in his class because I think they complement each other very, very well especially with the offense that we run for the past few seasons. So to me, I would probably go in my own order. I would probably go Glenn, then Parson, and then Collins, which is kind of funny because now we've both flip-flopped from what we talked about last week. Yeah, so Glenn is an interesting one because what you mentioned about the mechanics is true. I, I, I said this a few weeks ago. I think he is the most mechanically sound quarterback of the three. And, and nowadays, look, it's like such a DJ Uyunglele thing to hear, right? Like, oh, he's worked on his footwork this offseason. Like, this is going to work out for him. And then it, it really doesn't because you watch kids like Danny Cannell talks about this a lot where, like, just how atrocious mechanics have become, which is odd because kids, like, now all have private coaches and yet they're getting worse and worse at mechanics. Um, so you wonder with a kid that's very mechanically sound, is there room for improvement? Or if he's already doing those things right, is he at his apex? Can he... If, you know, what, what else are you going to teach him? You just kind of what have to hope he gets a little more accurate by through repetition. Um, you have to hope that he just gets a little stronger because he is going to get older. He's 17. Now he'll be 18 next year. Maybe he's 18. Now he'll be 19 next year. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you that like there is more upside to a kid that has just 
raw athleticism because there's a lot more molding to be done there. Um, but regardless of cannon too, like that man's got a freaking yeah, he could throw the ball really far. I mean, like, like I don't know if you saw, but that pass of Andreas Jacobs, that thing was just beautiful. Just, I did not see that specific one, but um, I, I did go watch some of his highlights, like I said, this past week. And, yeah, he throws the ball really far. I mean, he throws it hard. I don't know. I I worry a bit about his decision-making being slower than it should be because he knows his arm can bail it out. There were a few times on his tape where it looked like he wasn't throwing it early enough because he knows he can push it downfield, which, it, look, that may not even be bad, right, because – he can push the ball downfield, but with the speed of safeties in the college game, you're so, what bails you out in college won't always bail you out. I the, will say there are a school, lot sorry. of there's a lot of ugly throws in there because I didn't notice until I think they talked about this on one of the other podcasts where actually in the league that Parson plays in, you can't throw the ball away or else it's an it's an intentional grounding from the spot where you threw it, so you can't throw it out of bounds. So you have to at least what? throw the ball downfield. Yeah, that's like in his high school league. Yeah, that's it's that. Have you heard of this? That's ridiculously dumb. No, what league does he play? He because goes to Ravenwood High School in Brentwood. Is this like a? Is it like an IMG Academy type place? No, I, I think it's a regular, 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 regular school. I'm not going to say I don't believe them. I got to look that up though, because that's uh, it's weird, right? Well, just from a player safety standpoint, you'd almost think it would go the other way. Yeah, because exactly, like you're making too. kids hang in there to take hits. Uh, that doesn't like what high school? Whatever. All right, we, we've we've. Somebody look it up and check us in the comments, folks. Um, and while you're doing that, maybe open another browser tab and head over to betonline.net. It's got everything you need to get action down on the games you're watching. There's still some NHL left, still a little bit of NBA left, and the MLB is in full swing. So if you need something to get you through from now until the Knolls kick off in August, betonline.net is your place to go. Make sure when you go there, use promo code Locked On, and you will get a welcome bonus when you sign up. BetOnline.net, where the game starts. Folks, if you are rocking and rolling with us in the offseason, we appreciate it, and you will be rewarded for it. Just make sure you subscribe. Make sure you like the video. Make sure you hit the bell so you are alerted when we publish videos. We are, by the way, for the summer, a little housekeeping. Uh, we'll be doing three days a week. We're going to rock Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's that's our game plan. Every now and then we might have a little treat on Friday or something. But Drake, for this segment, I want to look at um, some statistical categories. We've talked about win totals quite a bit. And, um, you know, I know we were thinking, hey, well, let's 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 break it down to a lower level. We'll talk about what this team's going to do. And um, yeah, so I want to start with receiving because we talk about the passing game a lot. And the defense of the Jordan Travis faithful is that he really didn't have any weapons last year other than um, you know, Keyshawn coming back from the injury and surprisingly Pokey was there and uh, his tight end just decided not to improve, which we're hoping gets fixed this off season. So um, last year we had one player with this total, but this year, do you think we will have over or under one and a half players with more than five touchdown catches? I will probably say over primarily because I think you're going to actually probably see I really, really do think that Micah Pittman is going to actually probably be sort of that Debo Samuel kind of kind of wide receiver, meaning that he'll catch a lot of sweeps. He'll probably be a lineup in that backfield as a running back too as well. And then to pair him up with Winston Wright Jr. is going to come back in the first game. I'm just going to say that right now. And I think that's someone that he actually – I mean, what did he have in the Big 12? 800 receiving yards, double double the digit touchdown like catches. So, like, if you give me those two, I think those two can legitimately have at least five each. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I mean, I'm setting it pretty low, but if I was going to put it one and a half, I, I think be fair I'll take for it. Us, that's a very, you know, that's not too high. <laughs> it's a very friendly line. Um, now, yeah, six, 688 yards and he had five TD catches. So, you know, if, if I put it at two and a half, though, I start to wonder because when you have this team, and if you're going to do season totals, you have to think about it this way. This team, I think, has more than two and a half guys, right? So three guys or more that can catch five touchdowns. The question is, are they going to need to? No. Because we're expecting to have a much better offensive line than we had last year. We are expecting to have a very similar running back room to last year, assuming Trey Benson can perform to the level at which we expect. I mean, Jay Sean Corbin, I don't care what people say, that's a loss. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know if he's going to be a, you know, he's not going to make you lose an extra game kind of loss, but he is a loss in the red zone, especially. So I wonder, are we going to be throwing it 
in in the red zone very often. I don't know. Um, I just think also are you gonna see a lot, a lot of explosive to feed, touchdowns? I think there's gonna be a lot more mouths to feed overall. Like I mean, I don't like on top of my head, I don't know many wide receivers that Norvell had over at Memphis that I think there's three to four players having it having touchdowns. And with Norvell here, he's gonna actually have more options with, as we said, Winston Wright. Micah Pittman. Johnny Wilson might catch two or three, but I don't think he's going to be grabbing five. I think Cam McDonald, I think he, wasn't he also probably catching like, what, like three, two last yeah, two year? La- yeah, two last year. And I think so it was, so be- it was, uh, it was Pokey Wilson had five, and then Toa Philly had two, Parchman had two, Cam McDonald had two, Keyshawn Helton had two, and Malik McLean had two. Uh, Corbin had one, Treshawn Ward had one, Ja'Kai had one, um, Jordan Young had one, Wyatt Rector had one, and then obviously uh, Jordan Travis ran for one, so it's uh, well, I guess you can't count that because this is just receiving. But I mean, look, you, you had thirteen, so so that's a really interesting stat. That's what I, that's what that I mean. Way, right? I don't think you're gonna have. You might have two at most, which I think is a duel. But like, I we if we saw the offense last year the way it was, he likes to feed everybody. So it's kind of yep. like three is kind of a hot two have a number for me. No, I I think that's I think that's right. I mean, I I'd be interested. I need to look that up. Of like, you know, when you hear, hey, you only. <laughs> You only had one player have more than two touchdown catches. It sounds kind of bad, but then again, you had 13 players catch a touchdown. Don't think of it as 11 are on the field, right? Because you got to take out five offensive linemen. So typically you have, and, and a quarterback. It's like, so you have five guys at any given time on the field that can catch a touchdown. 13 of them did that for us last year. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty multiple offense. And in fact, we had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six guys rush for a touchdown last year. Um, so let me ask you this, Jordan Travis, seven touchdowns last year, Jay Sean Corbin, seven touchdowns last year, Trey Sean Ward, four touchdowns rushing last year, over under two and a half. So three is over two is under how many players this year. Do you think rush for more than four touchdowns or four or more? Yeah, I could definitely see that. I think Jordan will have at least probably five or six if he stays fully healthy. I think he's going to definitely going to try out like for him to I guess, throw the ball a little bit more because now he has the weapons on the outside. I think Trey Benson's going to get a lot of those goal line bigger carries. I think he's going to be your every down back probably by week four, week five. I mean, Trayshawn, too. I think Trey, we saw Trayshawn, his vision's very very well. His great catch back out of the, out of the backfield. And also, I think with Ja'Kai Douglas, you'll see him a lot more in the backfield. And again, Micah Pittman is going to be getting a lot of those sweeping routes. He's also probably be lining up like Debo and rushing the ball. So that's at least four right there. Do you think they'll run Jordan as much this year? Because I look at these stats and it's like Jordan, first of all, I mean, 530 yards as a quarterback is great, but playing 10 games, he ran the ball 134 times. To put that in perspective, Jay Sean Corbin, your number one running back, ran the ball in 12 games 143 times. So Jordan Travis had the most rushing attempts per game of anyone on your roster. And you got to wonder this year, do you think Mike can afford to lean on him that way? Cause I think last year he, for better or for worse, felt like he had McKenzie Milton, but this year he's got to know that like keeping Jordan healthy has to be a priority, right? Like you can't run him 13 and a half times a game. You can't. And also some of it also went to the wide receivers, not playing very well, but also Jordan sometimes when the pocket was clean and wide receivers actually were open with one of the few times kind of like, Oh, they're finally open. What do I do? I've never actually been in a situation before. So it's also (laughs) like he, to me with Jordan is it's both with Mike has to be very, I guess, conservative when when it comes to moving around the pocket, but then also Jordan has to have enough faith in himself to throw the ball and also, you know, complete some of the passes that we, the deep balls there. We saw with Ja'Kai Douglas several times. We saw with on Lawrence to a Philly play as well. It's the short intermediate routes, especially the routes over the middle. I think he was, like second to last in the ACC QB QB wise when it comes to um, throws over the middle, he needs to complete those. And I think with Jordan, he wants to take the next step. And if his team wants to win seven games, he needs to probably be a more of a, not a pure pocket passer, but he needs to be a lot more of a passer for this coming season. So to me, it's going to be a little more to the pass heavy side. Not sorry, not pass heavy. It's going to be a little more passing from last year. But I think it's going to be probably with the run, rushing wise. I don't want Jordan rushing more than a hundred times a game. I'm sorry, hundred times for the season. Yeah, that's that's a lot of runs. Although I will say, and and then I'm going to tell the folks about Built Bar, and and then we'll we'll keep it rolling. Um, one thing about Jordan last year is he he did run to throw a lot more too. So for every time you know maybe guys were open and he and he didn't um, and he pulled it down still, which um, anyway, it's a different conversation. But he did have a lot of times where he was more patient too and kind of running and making the making the shallow coverage bite and then trying to throw it. Um, so I hope we see a lot more of that this year, right? Or yeah, it's like. 
great. Use your legs to set up a throw or to, you know, maybe pull if, if you know, if a guy's in man coverage on a drag route, pull that guy off, but then still dump it over and keep yourself healthy because, um, you know, last year it was an unmitigated disaster when Jordan Travis got hurt. And I think that this year it will be even worse because um, even though, you know, one of his like legs was clearly still hurt from his pretty catastrophic injury and the, the velocity on the ball and the strength never really came back with Milton mentally, he was a great quarterback. So he at least knew how to manage a game, even though he couldn't always physically do it. I don't think we have that in either of them in our backups this year. So uh, it would be a lot worse, but folks, I don't know, man, AJ Duffy, he might be, uh, he might be starting, you know, game number six or game number seven. You never know. That is a very realistic scenario. Um, I think we should talk about it, but folks, first, let me tell you about built bar. You I mean, y'all already know you're here. You eat built bars. I'm sure you do. You go to built.com, use promo code locked 15, you get 15% off your order. It's delicious. It's nutritious. It is scrum deadly umptious. As they say, it's 15 grams of protein. It's four grams of sugar, four grams of carbs. It is built for you. So make sure that y'all eat your built bars. And again, go to built.com, use promo code locked 15 to get 15% off your order. And folks, before we dive into AJ Duffy, just make sure that you are subscribed to the YouTube channel. Make sure that you are, uh, you know, doing all the things, the bell, the thumbs up, the likes, and make sure you listen on the podcast every now and then. If you're on the go, the podcast is the same as the YouTube. It is locked on Seminoles podcast, your team every day, except again, like we said in the off season, it's every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Yeah, so so that, I think you're right there, dude. That's a that's a very realistic possibility that you have AJ Duffy um, starting at least one game this year. So let me ask for the over under on that. How many do you think over under half a game AJ Duffy starts this year? Oh, over. That's not. That's you get you get to do a better number than that, man. That's really but no technicalities. He's got to start. It can't be take goes in no, for no, a series, I, blows I, it, I, and then he pulls I know, it. I know. Okay. I know. Like I'm talking about like JJ Duffy is starting like probably like we know on Tuesday or Wednesday he's starting. I'm talking about. Yeah. See, I don't know. I don't. The only way I see that happening is if Jordan gets hurt and it's a serious injury and he's out for multiple weeks in a row. He's not, you know, minute to minute. Like he is definitely out for a couple of weeks and Tate just sucks miserably. So Tate plays like himself. In, okay. In the first game, he's starting. Before we do this, like, like we don't hate the kid. He's just what he's not been good at what we've seen so no. far. No, here's the here's what we hate about Tate Rodemaker. And I'll admit this because this is this is just how I feel. I don't like that our school and our program has gotten to a point where he is our backup quarterback. Like to me, it's like how have we fallen so low? I'm sure he's a great dude. I appreciate he puts in the effort. But we used to always have a Tate Rodemaker on the roster. Their names were like J.J. Constantino, you know, and guys like that who were like fine practice squad guys who could go in as a third or fourth string if you really needed them Co- to. Constantino. Let's not, you know, confuse him with my pleasure with Nick Constantino. It's Constantino. I hung out with him this weekend. Nice. Uh, but, yeah, no, it, okay, fine, whatever, Constantino. But the, <laughs> it was always those guys, right? Now it's like it's not Tate Rodemaker I don't like. It's that we're at the point where that is our option if our starter gets hurt, and that is – frustrating and terrifying but anyway i think he'd have to go out there have an absolutely atrocious game and for them to say okay duffy's definitely going to start this game this next game like like you said on tuesday starter but crazier things have happened i mean he gets a two-week injury take throws three picks in one game duffy comes in plays pretty well you you probably would see that i just i think it would be one of those bets my brain won't let me take like i i can't because then I'm basically saying Jordan's gonna get hurt for multiple weeks. I'm I'm trying to trying to have good See, energy. Like, and part good of me kind today. of part of me kind of feels that I think there might be at least one game that AJ starts that we're because we see probably a struggling Jordan Travis, and it's because that Mike Nervell kind of fully understands that this season is leading is not. I mean, you said it before, like he's not on the hot seat, but this is the season where like, if you don't perform well, or you don't actually, you know, at least win six or seventh game that he's going to be a lame um, dead man walking for year four. So whenever someone's desperate, they try to go with someone that they feel is truly the future. So with, if he's him starting AJ Duffy, we win a game, say it's, you know, in week number eight in Georgia tech, or it's the week before that we play NC state would be NC state somehow, some way. So to me overall, like that could be something that, Mike Norvell hasn't been able to showcase his system with his QB and with AJ Duffy being here as a spring enrollee and actually having the full time to, you know, get some size, got to come in with the playbook overall. Like that could be something that 
like, you know, what was the last minute, not last minute, like basically what's the word Custer's last stand. That could be his own thing with AJ Duffy over, over in Raleigh. Like to me, that's probably the time you will see it. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that, but you know, I, I don't know, man. And, and this is something I haven't said before, but we do talk a lot about like Mike Norvell and his offense and this, that, the other, like Mike Norvell's 40 years old and it's his third year at Florida state. Like, what really is Mike Norvell's offense? Like, I, I, I'm not saying he doesn't have a, some concepts that he enjoys and they likes to do, but like, this is the longest coaching job he'll have ever had at the end of this season. So it's like, yeah, it, I kind of get the argument, but like, he spent more years not running Mike Norvell's offense than he has running. And, that, and that's his own damn fault because one, he hasn't been able to get a QB he wants actually to bring in here himself and put a stamp on it. That's his own damn fault for not recruiting properly. That's always going to happen when you, when, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm even counting how like he was always a co-coordinator before that. Like mm-hmm. he just had, it's not like he's a, he's not Nick Saban where he spent three decades developing a coaching philosophy is my point. Oh yeah. No, I'm not saying that his offense hasn't like he, like Pat Riley when he invented the trap defense back in, you know, NBA final. I, I just finished winning time folks. Watch that. It's a very damn good, very show. good show. Very, very damn good show. Very good show. But no, it's more that like, he, like his own concepts, you know, his deception wise, like it's more that the stuff and the trends he likes to do, we're not seeing that on full display as of yet. So then like, it's kind of like when I always say with an AD, when, when a new AD comes in, the head coach typically is not the guy that want to be there for the long term. Because like, if I'm going to get fired, I want to be fired by my own guy. So with Mike, to me, that guy is going to be AJ for better or for worse. Yeah. I'm just trying to think, I guess, like, you know, when you talk about like Jordan effectively getting benched for a true freshman, like I'm trying to think back and look at games of like, what game last year would it have been that that, that would have, been a logical answer and i don't know I, I don't i don't know if he had any games last year like that that we can we could point to that you'd say okay yeah i would have pulled him for a true freshman maybe clemson where's stats on clemson game sorry folks i'm on my other computer today so i don't have my big stat file i'm having to google it like a um like a normal human which is kind of a pain but hold on Clemson, I mean, he's 63% for two touchdowns and no picks. If that gets you benched, I, I mean, I don't and know. The thing is, you. though, that yardage, re- yard receiver wise, that's heavily inflated by the 75 yard catch by Lawrence Dillfield. I'll give him 40 yards. I'm pretty sure he was a 40 yard catch. And then that's when he did the. Uh, no, no, yeah, but I'm like saying, okay, there. take that out. He's okay. So he's, he, he's then 13 of 21 for two touchdowns and no picks. Right. So it's like, oh, okay. If we take out that touchdown, I guess he's still one and oh, like. You know, to, to me, as a quarterback, to get benched, you have to throw a lot of interceptions. Like Notre Dame, three picks. That one was – that may have been worthy of it, except, like, one That's of those picks one, was just – That was an, game one, though, against a team that you knew yeah, I was going to compete for the CFP. The best That's, defense you're going to play all year. Yeah, that's yeah, that that to me is a little more unfair. So yeah, I mean, I, I I think I mean I like what you're saying as a hot take. I think it'd be interesting to see if it happens. I just I don't know if last year if I can if I can look at any games where it's like yeah that would have been the one, but um, I guess to your point, if 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 we've only won four games and it's our ninth game of the season, then it like it, there's more pressure on him. Um, in in that right, if if folks agree with that, like that's fine. That just that comes down to what do you think AJ Duffy's going to be this year? Um, You know, I think Mike Norvell, I also was watching some film on kind of the same topic the other day. And, um, you know, they were talking about how Mike likes to stretch the field vertically. That's kind of his thing, but he does it in a weird way. And it relies on a lot of speed and a lot of um, a lot of quickness in the skill positions. So uh, I I always wonder, too, like how much of it is he doesn't have his quarterback and how much of it is he really just hasn't had the skill positions he likes to have. I mean, that could be true, too. I mean, Calvin Austin, the third just got drafted because he's a shifty, fast wide receiver. DeMonte Coxie was a highlight real kind of player at Memphis because he was fast and he was large. He was basically to more interiors was to be him when Mark Nervell got here. So it's not just Jordan. It's the wide receiver position as a whole. The tight ends, he actually likes to use the tight end. And so far, Cam and Donald has done great for blocking. Not much else than that besides the catch here and there. I mean, Wire Rector, you know, kudos to him for, you know, earning a scholarship and playing and blocking his ass off. He's not, he should not be your tight end too. And then with the offensive line, I mean, I give Jordan a lot, a lot of flack and it's deservedly so for his mechanics. It kind of is hard to be comfortable in the pocket when you have to potentially fear for your own damn life every single time you snap the ball. So it's a lot of things like that. Well, and to, you know, back to your very, very earlier point about Jordan taking off sometimes when guys were open. One, I, I 
think open is like, it's an easy thing to see, you know, when you can pause it, it's tougher when you're again, trying to see like which way was the safety moving that kind of stuff. Um, but also when you aren't sure your receivers are going to catch the ball and you're like, well, I know I can run for 10 yards or I can throw it 10 and he might drop it because that was a huge problem last year. So um, I think, I think that, though, uh, the dropping one though, that like you still got, you still at least got to throw unless he's dropped like two or three that game. That's a different story. I, think I, I don't, don't know, know, man. If I had Jordan Travis's legs again in the drops we had the last two years, I, I can see an argument for where it'd be like, because I don't remember any of him like getting a two yard run when a guy was open 15 yards downfield. It was more like he'd run for 12 when a guy may have gotten 20 and it's like, yeah, he probably should have thrown it, but I can kind of see where his brain was. Um, but I do think too, like it kind of, to kind of to, to, to agree with you in some aspects of it. I, I think that this year you're going to, you're going to have a strong, diverse portfolio of receivers, both by skill set, by body type and by abilities. And I think that you've got three guys in your backfield that can all help you in your read option game, but also catching the ball. And I do think that Jordan's going to have to take a pretty big step forward. I just don't know if like true freshman AJ Duffy, if Mike's ever going to like pull the rip cord on that, unless something just goes horribly awry. Now, if he were a sophomore, I th- I would, I think I, I, I if, he's a sophomore, I don't think, if, if he's a sophomore, I don't think Jordan Travis is even starting, if we're being completely honest. Maybe. I mean, again, we don't know anything about it. But also, yeah. like, I know that not a lot of people like to start a true freshman, and I am primarily in that boat. I'm not saying that it should be their right idea, but, I mean, we saw, you mentioned earlier in the show, Sam Howell started as a true freshman, and he yeah, did and- admirably well. And Sam, I'm pretty sure A.J. Duffy and him were ranked similarly. The only difference is, AJ Duffy's a lot bigger than Sam Howell. Sam Howell was like just just basically a Baker Mayfield. With Jordan, I mean, you're right. This is where Jordan finally has the weapons and the tools around him on the offensive line, much more improved. Wide receivers, you finally got some for the most part. Running backs, you lose Jason Corbin, but I think Trey Benson is going to definitely show out and show some people up. So to me, this is Jordan's make or break kind of year because I firmly believe that he will not be here past the season, in my personal opinion. Whether he performs well here and graduates transfer somewhere else, or simply he'll take his try to take his down to the league or AJ Duffy take the spot. Yeah, I'll agree with you on that. I, I really don't. And maybe it's just because it's been so long, but I, I really can't picture a scenario where Jordan Travis is your QB one next year. I know I said, like when we talk about it, it's like, I can, I can game out a scenario and make it sound realistic. But just, if you ask me like point blank, Max, do you think Jordan Travis is on this roster next year? It's like, no. I, I, and I don't even know why I think that. I just think it's going to get to the point where like, you know, he's either, I don't think he's going to try to go to the league, but he's got his degree. So I think he probably transfers somewhere and he's going to find either, you know, a Jalen Hurts type situation where he'll find an, like he's not Jalen Hurts, but he'll find an offense and like a coach that just, you know, he's going to talk to on the phone and they're going to click immediately. And it's going to be like, look, come be a, you know, come, come be a 1960s running back, right. That throws the ball. Sometimes I'm going to get you 4,000 yards and we're going to get some NFL team to roll the dice. You would crush at UCF with the Gus on, right? Something like that. I I think that's probably where he, maybe not UCF exactly, but yes, I I think that's probably what we see from him after this year. Or again, somehow he just skyrockets in improvement and he throws, you know, which I mean, I don't know. I don't so then over under for you over under Jordan Travis, 2,250 passing yards. I think over for sure. Because uh, when I, when y'all did your show on it, I was looking at him and if he had his attempts plus Milton's attempts last year, he would add like 2,800, I think with the same, all else being equal. Um, and I think that this year with, uh, with the skill positions he has, you should see an increase in yards per attempt. Um I think that's also Mike Norvell getting more into the offense he quote wants to run. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he breaks that 2,500 mark. Um, and I think if he plays all 12 games, you could see him challenge for 3000, which would be exciting or AJ Duffy will wait, come wait, in and relieve on, one on, game on, where he throws on, four picks. Do you think that Jordan Travis and our Lord and savior Beyonce Knowles is 2022 can throw for 3000 yards? Well, it's not that crazy, right? Like let's say he throws the ball 329 times. He completes what 63 per 62.9 percent of his passes. That's 206 completions, 206 times 7.9 yards per attempt. Oh, but that's per attempt, not per completion, isn't it? That's per attempt, yeah. So that's why I was like, why am I getting such a low number, folks? It's tough to math. Um, 
if it's yards per attempt, we literally would just do 329 times 7.9 because it'll work itself out with it in there. That put him at 2,600 yards. Um, you know, if you can bump that yards per attempt up to like a 8.3 or something, you know, you're getting to 27. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's that crazy to, to think that he could challenge 3,000. I think it's crazy to think he could. He's not going to go roaring through it. But, um, yeah, he just needs to throw the amount of passes that McKenzie Milton and him would have combined for last year. And he would need to – I can tell you exactly what his yards – per pass would need to be, or yards per attempt. Remember, this isn't completion, yards per attempt. So yards per attempt would be, have to be 9.1. Um, how crazy is that? Walk me through, like, who – what were, like, Tyler Van Dyke's yards per attempt last year? Tyler Van Dyke, out of 324 attempts, completion percentage was 202, had 2,931 yards. Okay, so he would have to be about comparable to that. If Jordan Travis is comparable to that, he'll throw for 3,000 yards on, on those attempts, right? Because that would give him five more than TVD had last year. I, I don't know. Whatever. We're belaboring the point. I do. I think uh, over under 20, what was it, 2250? Yeah, I said 2250. Because I, yeah, I'm I going to take over 2250. I think sure. that that's probably his ceiling. I think it's 2250. I don't know. If his ceiling is 2250, we're not going to win. Very, well, unless he runs for like 1,000. But no, I think he runs uh, for like 750 yards, maybe 800. So totaling to, to me, total he run he has total yards for 3,000. Like that's fine. I just because I don't think Jordan Travis is going to ever going to be a 2,500 yard passing quarterback. And also sometimes he just doesn't need to be. I, as of right now, if we want to win 10 games, we need 2,500, 2,750. But yeah, if we want to win mean, seven, 2,250. I guess for me, it's like the yards existed last year, right? Again, you look at his yards per attempt. If he just throws when McKenzie throws by A, staying healthy, but B, let's not forget two of those games were just the coaching staff doing, I don't, I mean, I guess Jordan was kind of banged up, but I don't, I don't know why it, it doesn't matter. All right. It's going to be really interesting folks. And we're going to be here throughout the off season for y'all, just like y'all are here for us. We know it's long. We know it's uh it's a bit tedious, but before we know it, we'll be playing Florida state football. Before you know it, it'll be tomorrow and we will be back in action. I'm Max. That was Drake in this was locked on Seminoles. Take care, everybody. And we are now 81 days from FSU kicking off against Duquesne. Josh Burrell, Josh Burrell days. From Josh Burrell days. Hey, we can start doing numbers now. We're under 100. 